Many thanks, Adrian McNeil. As some of you will know, I'm currently completing my doctorate, and my dissertation is on Sir Charles Villiers Stanford's organ music. In this particular talk, I'm taking a more sociological view than I usually take. I'll be concentrating not so much on what organ music Stanford wrote and played, but rather on whom he wrote and played it for. So I'll be a bit like the psychiatrist in the famous old joke, which I'm sure you all remember. You know the one. A psychiatrist is a man who goes to the Folie Bergère and looks at the audience. During the mid-19th century, the organist's role underwent greater changes than it had done for half a millennium beforehand. These changes were particularly striking in Britain and France, though they had their impact in the German-speaking lands also. And Stanford, by the very fact of having been born in 1852, was in an unusually good position to benefit from these changes, which he did. It was in North Germany around 1600 that the full pedal board first became a permanent, as opposed to occasional, feature of the organ. Until well past 1800, pedal boards usually remained either limited or non-existent on organs elsewhere. You can see here what a typical South German organ of the early 17th century looked like and how small an instrument it was. In England, as late as 1810, only two cathedral organs had pedals of any type. At least one English organist took a perverse pride in his lack of foot dexterity. This was Weber's friend, Sir George Smart, who, when asked in old age to perform upon an organ with pedals, indignantly replied, My dear sir, I never in my life played on a gridiron. Meanwhile, in France, the Paris Conservatoire's practice organ, on which the adolescent Franck had been trained during the 1830s, likewise had no pedal department whatsoever. Things improved in France in the 1840s and 1850s. On English organs, the requisite improvement had occurred slightly earlier, thanks overwhelmingly to Mendelssohn. With his North German upbringing, Mendelssohn would simply refuse to play on a particular English organ unless it had been equipped with a full and functional pedal division. Nevertheless, it wasn't from Germany, but from France, that the single most remarkable 19th century organ builder came. Aristide de Cavalier Coll combined the expertise of an engineer with the spirit of an artist. Vincent Dandy hailed Cavalier Coll as craftsman poet, in French, ouvrier poète. Even when Cavalier Coll didn't actually invent devices, he improved them and subordinated them to his vision, this vision, sharpened by his friendship with Berlioz, being to endow the organ with a quasi-orchestral power and variety of tone. My new organ, it's an orchestra, Mon nouvel orgue, c'est une orchestre. Thus, Franck exclaimed delightedly in 1853 on being confronted at his Paris church with a product of Cavalier Cole's workshop. Where Cavalier Cole led, other organ builders followed, and not in France alone. He himself sold organs to churches and municipalities in Britain, the Netherlands, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, and Denmark not to mention Argentina, Venezuela, and Brazil. His influence extended across the Rhine, too. Several German builders promoted the symphonic organ among their compatriots, and without such an instrument, the lush, kaleidoscopic, seething Wagnerian Straussian organ music by Max Reger and Siegfried karg Elliot would have been impossible. As for England, one need only examine the stop lists of the chief organ builders from the 1860s on to recognise the impact which Cavalier Cole's symphonic imagination had on even manufacturers without any formal connections to him. Not until the 1920s did a reaction against Cavalier Cole and against the symphonic romantic organ more generally set in. 
that was when the German-derived Orgelbewegung, organ reform movement, demanded that the organ return to its contrapuntal and non-orchestral Baroque roots. But the Orgelbewegung triumphed only when Kavaye Kol and Stanford were dead. In Stanford's time, and long afterwards, the king of instruments, to use the words uttered by Mozart and uttered four centuries beforehand by Guillaume de Machaut, attracted a mass audience in a way that for most Western nations of the 21st century is unimaginable. France remains a partial exception. The organ then performed a crucial function in disseminating many kinds of music. This function it long ago gave up to commercial recordings, radio broadcasts, and latterly online streaming services. Most listeners in Victorian and Edwardian Britain, as well as on much of the continent, obtained their first exposure to symphonic and operatic masterpieces, not via orchestral concerts or the theatre, but in one of three ways, through piano duet arrangements suitable for home use, through brass bands, whether as listeners or as players, and through attending organ recitals. This meant that every organist who hoped to win over the public needed to include in recitals numerous transcriptions of music which had been written for entirely different forces. If such an emphasis on transcribed material meant, as it generally did mean, slighting works that had been written for the organ in the first place, then this was a penalty that organists of Stanford's epoch willingly paid. Stanford himself, especially at first, proved no exception. He began his career as organ recitalist by concentrating on playing works that had originally been meant for other media. When he devoted himself less and less to performing arrangements, more and more to performing original organ compositions, he did so with a cautious, tactful gradualism that he seldom displayed anywhere else. An organist born, like Stanford, in 1852, had occupational choices of which he would have suspected nothing if he'd been born even in 1802, let alone in 1752 or 1652. This novel variety of options reinforced existing tendencies for organists to be independent artistic agents in a manner that Couperin, Buxtehude and Bach certainly had never been and probably had never wanted to be. Mendelssohn, during the 1830s and 1840s, had prefigured the late 19th century's freelance tendencies among organists. Though his own brilliance at the console could have gained for him any permanent European organ post that he wished, he preferred to avoid playing the organ within a professional occupational infrastructure. Instead, he operated as, to cite a recent American scholar's description of him, the greatest amateur organist in history. What did that professional occupational infrastructure entail? It entailed, to start with, musical networks that still possessed, for Stanford and his contemporaries, a visibility hard to imagine in our time. Roland Smith, American expert on 19th century organ literature, is correct to stress how seldom nowadays those who write about outstanding composers' careers bother to consider their subjects organ playing. A passage from Roland Smith remains especially pertinent to the topic. Few lines, if any, Smith writes, in musicians' biographies describe their activities as organists, although many began their career as organists or held organ posts to supplement their incomes. The lives of Mozart, Schubert, Brahms, Liszt, Bruckner, Mendelssohn, Sassons, Elgar, Gounod, and Puccini scarcely mention their association with the organ. End of quote. Smith's list is by no means complete. He could have added to it Forte, Dvorak, Janacek, Sibelius, Holst, Adolf Adam, Leo de Lieb, Vaughan Williams, and John Ireland, as well as Stanford himself, not to mention Parry. A handful of world-famous composers have been exceptions to the rule. After all, it's impossible to write at any length about Bach, Handel, Franck, and Messiaen without discussing the organ's unmistakable importance in their musical careers. But otherwise, the, historical, the historiographical picture is precisely as Smith painted it. Aggravating the problem, in Stanford's case, is the unusual nature of his own organ-playing activity. 
which mostly occurred in the chapel of Trinity College, Cambridge, between 1873 and 1892. His job there involved choral direction as well as organ performance, but he never had any cathedral or cathedral-like post. He was among the earliest organist composers not to follow this path. Until the mid-19th century, the idea of a professional organist who acted as a contract worker remained largely inconceivable. The clear majority of professional organists before Stanford's time, if not indeed all of them, simply had to be affiliated with some sacred building or other, whether the mightiest of cathedrals or the most intimate of monarchical chapels. In Stanford's youth, the best known among English organists perfectly illustrated this ecclesiastical association, to wit Samuel Sebastian Wesley, who from 1832 to 1876 served at successive cathedrals, Hereford, Exeter, Winchester, as shown here, and Gloucester. Wesley did so not through preference, not through outstandingly devout temperament, but because other and more appealing livelihoods had been closed to him. They would have stayed closed to him even if his own acrid temper had not been notorious. Wesley set the bar for invective so high that even Stanford could not consistently surmount it. From an 1899 account of Wesley, quote, there was an officious minor canon at Gloucester who was of an amiable but meddling disposition. One afternoon after service, he came up to Wesley and said, I think the anthem went very badly today. I also consider that it was taken too fast. Sir, said Wesley, drawing himself up, I am at the head of my profession. You, sir, are a nobody. I am amazed at your audacity. Good afternoon, sir. Unquote. Comprehensive musical schooling at a tertiary level, such as the Paris Conservatoire and the École Niedermeyer, already provided in France, was still pretty much unknown in Britain. London's Royal College of Music didn't open its doors until 1882, so Wesley couldn't, as Franck in Paris could, augment earnings as an organ performer by profitably labouring as a regular salaried organ teacher. From the time of Stanford's boyhood dates not only the beginning of professionalised British education for musicians in general, but the rise of the virtuoso concert organist with few or no long-term church connections. The central relevant British name is that of William Thomas Best, the leading concert organist in Britain, and probably the world, from the 1850s until his death in 1897. Best's musical headquarters was no church, but an impeccably secular institution, St George's Hall in Liverpool. The hyperactive Best gave in that hall three recitals every single week for almost four decades, save when on foreign travels, which included visits to Australia and Italy. While in Australia, he inaugurated the Sydney Town Hall's organ, famous among organists around the world for its 64-foot contra trombone stop. If you've ever wondered what a 64-foot contra trombone stop sounds like, wonder no more. Liszt was one of several continental musicians who held Best's playing in high esteem. Hans von Bülow admired Best's playing so much that he expressed the wish to have his youth all over again so that he could study the organ under Best's tutelage. Usually, Best's repertory consisted not of pieces written for the organ, though he played those when he needed to, but of orchestral and operatic transcriptions, sometimes his own, sometimes by others. Best's mantle as organist composer fell most conspicuously upon Edwin H. Lemaire, who settled in America and also toured repeatedly throughout the British Empire, including at least one visit to Melbourne. Like Best, Lemaire specialised in both writing and playing transcriptions. His arrangements of Brahms, Elgar, Verdi, Wagner and Saint-Saëns achieved a prominence among recitalists 
which has yet to die out. Nor were British organists alone in this pragmatic, eclectic attitude. Alexandre Gilmore, although he held church and academic posts, attained his greatest celebrity as a concert recitalist in Britain, Canada, the USA, and his native France. He too performed a great many arrangements. In fact, his best known piece is his organ version of See the Conquering Hero Comes from Handel's Judas Maccabeus. Consequently, when Stanford the organist appropriated music from other media, he did no more and no less than his job required and his contemporaries expected. Regardless of this, Distinguished European organist composers often stayed loyal to the ancient model of regular ecclesiastical employment. For instance, Franck worked at the Basilica of Saint Clotilde for almost 40 years. Charles-Marie Vidor remained in harness as temporary organist at another major Parisian church, Saint-Sulpice, for more than six decades. With the Teutonic countries, as with France, ecclesiastical employment remained very common. This is hardly surprising when one remembers that just as Anglicanism was the legally established and privileged church in England, though not in Ireland or Wales, so Catholicism was the legally established and privileged church in Austria, Bavaria, the Rhineland, Liechtenstein, and various cantons of Switzerland. Bruckner's tenure as Austrian monastery organist is famous. Josef Gabriel Reinberger, born in Liechtenstein but mostly resident in Bavaria, worked as church organist and professor in Munich. He ended his days as Kapellmeister to Bavarian royalty, first to no less renowned a patron than Ludwig II of Wagnerian fame, and then to Ludwig's younger brother Otto. Unlike Sassars, Guillemot and Vidor, Reinberger never visited Britain. But his name had become familiar to British musicians between the 1880s and his death in 1901, a fact confirmed by British magazines of the period, where he's always mentioned with respect. There had also arisen, during Stanford's youth, a third method by which organists could earn their keep. This was the method of the all-rounder, for whom organ playing constituted merely one valued musical discipline and income stream among several. Two other important figures, both French, exemplify this approach, Sassons and the much lesser known Gabriel Pierne. Pierne, unlike Sassons, never, as far as can be determined, met Stanford. Still, the resemblances between his career and Stanford's career can't be denied. Just as Stanford's Irish birth made him something of an alien in England, so Pierne's Lorraine birth made him something of an alien in France. The Germans controlled Lorraine from 1871, in which year the Pierne family moved from the Lorraine city of Metz to Paris. Moreover, Pierne had been a pianistic child prodigy, just as Stanford had been. Like Stanford, Pierne switched during his adolescence from concentrating on the piano to concentrating on the organ. When Franck died in 1890, Pierne, then a mere 27 years old, succeeded him as chief organist at Saint Clotilde. This job he bequeathed in 1899 to fellow Franck disciple Charles Tournemire. Thereafter, Pierne, like Stanford at a slightly later age, ceased to play the organ on an established, acknowledged professional basis. He achieved, once again like Stanford, national celebrity as a conductor, although Pierne preferred to specialize in orchestral and ballet direction instead of the operatic and choral direction that dominated Stanford's timetable. Among the world premieres that Pierne conducted was that of the Firebird for the Ballet Russe in 1910. As composer, Pierne cultivated, like Stanford, an unobtrusive, abidingly craftsmanlike idiom that seldom, if ever, tore passion to tatters. In short, the examples of Sassons and Pierne proved that it could still be possible, probably inevitable, for Stanford to reach considerable heights as an organist without being constricted as a creator. Like Stanford, Sassons and Pierne were fundamentally generalists, not specialists. 
all three masters exhibited something else also the art of being a musical patriot without at all being a musical chauvinist except in the cases of Sassons and Stanford during the 1914-1918 war when both men engaged in a good deal of chauvinist rhetoric strangely very little of Stanford's organ music dates from his Trinity College years the bulk of it came much later when he no longer had regular organ playing commitments Biographer Paul Rodmel suggests that Stanford abandoned the regular organist's life through increasing boredom with the organ as such. This conjecture is implausible, not least given how Stanford returned repeatedly to organ writing after 1892. Physical exhaustion through the workload of his teaching and his conducting, don't forget he occupied two concurrent professorships, is much likelier than any emotion of tedium to account for his cessation of routine organ playing duties. To sum up, Stanford was neither a purely ecclesiastical employee nor a purely secular employee. He remained open to artistic trends but largely escaped the more exclusively church bound and concert hall bound musicians of his day. As so often elsewhere in his life, so when it came to playing the organ, Stanford blended the new and the old, or, to express the same sentiment in different words, he was a conservative revolutionary. Instead of making an overt breach with current fashion by completely avoiding organ arrangements, Stanford preferred to play these alongside original organ works. Occupying the commanding heights of secular musical administration in both London and Cambridge, rather than being compelled to function under obedience to a bishop or a monarch, gave Stanford various advantages. He avoided much of the daily grind and the innate narrowing of repertory faced by overtaxed cathedral musicians needing to maintain discipline among fractious juvenile choristers. We've got time for a very short Stanford work, so I'll play it. It's based on the traditional Irish air, St. Columba, best known as a hymn, which is generally sung to words beginning, the king of love my shepherd is, or else to words beginning, O oh, breathe on me, O oh, breath of God. The tune is a quite familiar one. Be warned in advance that this CD track is recorded in that infuriating British cathedral style where there's tons of atmosphere, but the microphone was probably placed somewhere in the cathedral's parking lot, and the first listener to perceive a single organ modulation wins a prize. I wish that Chandos or Hyperion had recorded Stanford's organ pieces because they have much better sound than the Priory label ever manages. It was Priory which released this recording. But so far, they haven't, more's the pity. Anyway, here we go.
Perhaps I can best describe Stanford's artistic synthesis through a Venn diagram, where Irish musical culture, European musical culture, and English musical culture intersected, there was Sir Charles himself. To conclude, I can't help mentioning an extraordinary comment by Peter Racine Fricker, whose compositions enjoyed brief fame in Britain during the 1950s. Interviewed by the Times in 1958, Fricker came up with what I consider an astonishingly self-serving remark about himself and other British composers of his generation. Quote, what has happened since the war is that we've become aware that Europe exists, unquote. Earth to Fricka. The fact is, well before the other war, Stanford had been well and truly aware that Europe exists. Parry had been well and truly aware that Europe exists. So had Elgar, so had Bax, so had Vaughan Williams, who after all studied with Ravel in Paris and with Max Bruck in Berlin. So had George Butterworth, who was so aware of the existence of Europe that he actually got himself killed there in the bloodbath of Flanders Fields during 1916. I wouldn't have included Fricker's foolish comment at all, except to show that it's impossible to comprehend Stanford without comprehending the deep marks that continental Europe left on him and on so many other eminent British composers of his time. This is as true of Stanford's involvement with the organ as it is of his other musical activity. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much.